In this lecture, we are going to be looking at the artwork of Frida Kahlo. Um, she was born June 6, 1907 and died June 13, 1954. Uh, some people suspect that she might have actually committed suicide, but this has never been proven. Um, so we're going to look at Frida Kahlo because she is actually classified, um, often described as a Mexican-American artist. And this tends to happen a lot with artists who do works and live in both another country and the United States. Um, the United States tends often to claim them also as American artists. Um, we're going to see Frida Kahlo move to the United States with Diego Rivera, her husband at the time, in 1930. They actually moved to the San Francisco area and then throughout the rest of their lives would work and show works around the United States. They would return to Mexico and even Europe at different times, but um, because of this, she is looked at as a Mexican-American artist. Now, she did not start painting until 1925, after she was in a horrific bus accident where she was pierced by a handrail through her pelvis. Basically, a trolley car hit their bus, the handrail came off, and it, it um, pierced her pelvis. Her spine was fractured in three places, her pelvis was crushed, and her right foot and leg were severely broken. She spent a month in the hospital and was flit fitted with a plaster corset that she would actually wear throughout her life. This accident would often leave her in pain and leave her in near constant pain for the rest of her life. After the accident, she was confined in bed for three months, and this is when she began painting. She had actually no formal training in painting. And these are images you see here. You see her on the right. This is her painting in bed after the accident. And on the left, this is one of her self-portraits. Uh, Kahlo actually produced about 200 paintings in her life, and most of them are self-portraits. The one on the left here is self-portrait with thorn necklace and hummingbird from 1940. Now, as her became, paintings became more well-known, she was often lumped in with the surrealist artists, but she herself very specifically claimed she was not a surrealist. Uh, what surrealists were trying to do, um, there is the Surrealist Manifesto that was written by Andre Breton, which you'll read about him in the article. Um, and what the surrealists claimed that they were trying to do was trying to find what they considered ultimate reality. They were very heavily influenced by the uh, theories of Freud and what they thought ultimate reality was our conscious brain and our unconscious brain. And this ultimate reality was finding a way to connect these two into what they called surreality. However, again, Frida Kahlo herself claimed she was not a surrealist artist. Okay, so I had you read an article. Now, this article was actually inspired by the movie Frida that came out in 2002 starring Selma Hayek. Um, but it's a good article because it gives you a very thorough yet succinct history of the artist. Um, interesting enough with the movie, if you ever want to see it, it is a truly excellent movie. Uh, Selma Hayek was nominated for the Academy Award for her role as Frida Kahlo. But what we're going to focus on in this lecture is we're going to focus on Kahlo's own exploration and struggles with her identity. Now, she was born Magdalena Carmen Frida Kahlo y Caldron. Um, she grew up in what's called the Casa Azul, which is the blue house, in a suburb of Mexico City. Now, her parents, her father was Guillermo Kahlo. He was a German Jew who actually migrated to Mexico in 1891 at the age of 19. He met her mother, who was actually his second wife after his first wife passed away. Her mother was Matilda Calderon, and she was um, a Catholic woman with ancestry that includes both um, Indians and a Spanish general. So she is what we consider, you know, the mestiza. Also influencing uh, Frida's sense of identity were her political beliefs, and you can look at those or you can read those more in the article. And then also, very importantly, her relationship with her husband, Diego Rivera. Uh, Diego Rivera himself, very famous uh, Mexican mur Mexican American muralist. They met when she was still um, in school. Uh, they didn't have a romantic relationship till later, but he was 21 years older than her. They married August 21st, 1929. 
And they both, neither of them, were, um, they both had many different affairs, um, including Diego had an affair with uh, Frida's sister, and this caused a lot of hurt for Frida. Um, but you're going to see she also had affairs with both men and women. Eventually, they divorced in 1939, yet in December of 1940, they remarried, and they remained married until Kala passed away. So what we're going to look at in this is we're going to look at a couple of her paintings and we're going to see how her paintings are an expression of her identity and more so an expression of her, you know, struggling with her identity or making claims about it. And we see the first one here. This one's titled My Grandparents, My Parents and Me from 1936. In this painting, you can see Kala is the naked little girl holding the loop of a red ribbon. That is to represent her bloodline. And it's interesting because the ribbon literally supports her family tree. Almost, you know, it's very effortless. It's almost as if, you know, her grandparents who are in the background, almost like balloons floating on the clouds. However, if you look at the ribbon, the ribbon has a loop. And that loop is literally placed at the exact spot where her parents' bodies overlap. Also, we can see in her mother, her mother's dressed in the traditional uh, white Mexican dress. That's her wedding dress. And you can see a fetus literally in her womb. And that is Frida Kahlo herself before she was born. And then again, in the clouds, right, we have uh, her grandparents. Now, both her parents and her grandparents' images here were painted uh, inspired from their actual wedding pictures. So what we can see, her parents are recognized as either Mexican or German uh, by their particular position over the dry earth or the ocean. So on the left are her Mexican parents, on the right are her German parents. Um, Frida's parents themselves are also based, I think I already said this, on their, on their wedding photos. And what we see in this, literally Frida's in the middle, we see Casa Azul, the blue house, but this is a representation of Frida at one point, you know, celebrating her heritage, but also showing this dual identity that she had from the beginning. Often in her life, she felt like she was trying to um, be forced to divide her loyalties between Mexico and her Europe or Euro European influences, including American influences, which were traditionally European based. Now we see this even further in images such as this one. This painting is self-portrait along the borderline between Mexico and the United States. And this one is from 1932. And here we can very clearly see her conflict between Mexican and American identities. Remember, she and Diego Rivera moved to the United States for the first time in 1930. In the United States, Frida Kahlo often felt like she was forced to be proper or someone that she herself was not. You can see in this, Mexico is represented on the left and the United States is represented on the right. The sun and the moon are both over Mexico. And we, this tells us this is probably where Frida wanted to be, right? She hung both the sun and the moon there. Um, this was painted during the time when Diego Rivera was actually hired by Henry Ford and was painting different murals in Detroit and murals within the Detroit Institute of the Art. This was a time where, you know, he's celebrating modern industry, yet she's yearning for the ancient um, agrarian culture of Mexico. Um, she herself is painted. She is standing here in the middle. And she's dressed up very uncharacteristically for her. Here we see her in this very sweet pink dress with lace gloves. This is not typically how she dressed. She usually wore very vibrant clothing that celebrated her Mexican heritage. And she herself is very far from Dumour, right? This idea that her being this sweet little thing is not what her personality was. And we see she kind of shows this within here too. If you actually look, her nipples are shown beneath her bodice. And in a defiance of propriety, she holds a cigarette in her hand. And she's also holding a small Mexican flag, which again is telling us where her loyalties lie. She's literally standing on the boundary stone that marks the border between, the Me between Mexico and the United States. And the stone, interesting enough, is inscribed, Carmen Rivera painted her portrait in 1932. So she didn't sign this with Frida Kahlo as she typically went. 
Some scholars say that perhaps she used her Christian name and her husband's last name as part of her pretense of being proper. Um, she often loved to shock high society patrons in the United States by at first seeming to be very shy and then coming off with off-color expressions delivered in slightly incorrect English to make it seem as if she really didn't know what they meant. Um, Frida herself, she knew what it meant, and she was actually known, especially when she spoke in Spanish, that she would uh, swear a lot, which would not be considered proper in high society. Some other scholars think she could have used the name Carmen Rivera instead of Frida Kahlo because that is what the press actually called her in articles where they talk about Rivera. And she was often described as Rivera's petite wife who sometimes dabbled in paint. So in this, we can see that literally she is creating herself as she was seen in America. Also here we can see what she thinks about the two countries, right? Where the Mexican side, it's celebrating the objects in there are celebrating much of Mexican heritage, which on the American side, completely taken over by industry and factory. And in fact, what looks like, you know, on the left-hand side, we've got the moon and the star, I'm sorry, the moon and the sun and the clouds. On the right-hand side, what looks like clouds, well, when you take a closer look at it, it's actually the smoke, right, the pollutants from the factory, and it's literally covering up the American flag. Now, some scholars also talk about um, her using her name, Carmen Rivera, um, as a point of Diego actually supporting her. He would often introduce uh, Kahlo to reporters as his name is Carmen, and another time he called her La Pintora Mas Pintor, which is both the Mexican for the feminine and the masculine terms used for painter. And he did this to recognize her strength and also to perhaps uh, talk about her androgynous nature. In self-portrait of the borderline over Mexico, again, we see the fire-spitting sun and a quarter moon are enclosed in clouds, right? They touch, they create this um, bolt of lightning. And if you actually look at the smokestacks on the American side, they literally are labeled Ford, talking about you know, how she sees Henry Ford and the industrialization. Um, the Mexican side, again, has a partially ruined pre-Columbian temple. The United States has the bleak skyscrapers. And we also see on the Mexican side pre-Columbian fertility idols, possibly talking about her own um, inability to have children. She had many miscarriages throughout her life. Uh, many doctors think this was uh, from complications from the accident. Also, what's interesting, if you look at the bottom, Mexico has many um, exotic plants with white roots, and the United States has three round machines with black electric cords. If you look at the machine nearest Frida, it has two cords. One connects with a Mexican lily's white roots, roots perhaps showing you know, the United States is taking Mexico or her purity. A white lily is usually a symbol of purity or even showing that United States is literally feeding off of Mexico. Sorry, my dog started whining. Um, the other is actually plugged into the United States side of the border marker, which serves as Frida's pedestal. So here we can clearly see part of that conflict of identity between Mexican-American. I think clearly this shows her favoritism for the Mexican identity, yet we can see here, you know, how she feels like she is forced to literally be somebody else to, to be uh, accepted in America, and she herself is literally standing on that borderline. She is divided between the two. Now we see in a third painting here, this one is called My Dress Hangs There from 1933. And this is after more than three years of staying in America. Frida definitely at this point wanted to go back to Mexico desperately, but Rivera was enjoying his fame and popularity he got from the United States, and he did not want to go back to Mexico at this time. And this painting is, again, a result of this conflict. Here she's trying to depict what she considered um, the superficiality of American capitalism, the painting is filled with the icons of the modern industrial society of the United States, but it's implied that that society is decaying and the fundamental human values are destructed. You can see in the background 
We're looking at New York City. We can tell this because we see the Statue of Liberty there. And if you pay closely attention, right, you see these ideas of destruction, right? Again, the factories in the back right. We see the man, the figure, and it's turned more into a machine. And this is talking about, you know, her um, communist ideas where it's showing that, you know, that in capitalistic societies, men are looked at not as individuals, but literally as production of the workforce. They are there to be part of the machine and not celebrated for their individualism. Also, we see if you look on the front left, part of the city is on fire. Also on the front left, you see there is a toilet, which is literally placed on a pedestal. And so what's interesting is why she was doing this painting, her husband was working on a mural in Rockefeller Center, and this mural was celebrating or supposed to celebrate the industrial progress in America. That mural itself has a very interesting story behind it. Uh, it's called Man Controller of the Universe, so you can look that up on your own. There's a very interesting story there. Now what's interesting in this, right, Unlike most of her other paintings, Kala herself, we physically don't see here. All we see is her dress is hanging there. And it's hanging there empty and alone, surrounded by the chaos in the background. It almost seems like she's saying, I may be in America, but only my dress hangs there. My life is in Mexico. Or perhaps this is another comment on how she herself felt she was never really seen in the United States as she wanted to be. That she was always seen either under um, Diego Rivera's shadow or on this identity that the United States seemed to force on her, which she felt was not hers. Um, she again began this painting while they were in New York, but she did complete it after Diego Rivera and she came back to Mexico. And now this last painting that we're going to look at is probably one of her most famous paintings, and it's called The Two Fridas, uh, 1939, and it is also an oil on canvas. And this one depicts not one, but two images of the artist. And this one has been interpreted many different ways. The image on the left depicts Frida in her European heritage. Uh, we see her spotless white dress is stained with blood dripping from a vein she's attempting to clamp. And if you notice though too, the dress looks a lot like her mother's wedding dress from the first painting we looked at, my grandparents, my parents, and me. On the right is seen as her more Mexican version. Uh, she's adorned in deep blue, green, and yellow, and clutching a portrait of her husband in her hand. These mirror images uh, show the duality in which she saw herself, split between two backgrounds and two cultures that she spent most of her life trying to balance. Um, a major detail in this work is the exposed hearts and veins forming a bridge between the pair. The European Frida's heart is raw and incomplete, and the lace adorning her dress is torn, exposing her breast. The vein leaving the heart is cut, and this is what is spilling blood over the lap of the dress, while again Frida attempts to clamp off the flow. In contrast, her Mexican counterpart's heart is complete, and her dress is unmarred. A vein connects the full heart to a photo of De Rivera, who at the time of this painting she had just divorced. So what we see here is the severing of the once full union of the hearts and veins can symbolize the heartbreak and pain she's experienced at this time from the loss of both Rivera and her stable identity that he supported. And also, you know, it can show the severing of the two identities, the European American identity and the Mexican identity. Right? The, th the theme of this duality of life and nature is further supported by the juxtaposition of the sky and the earth within the painting. We see the clouded sky behind the two women is seen as a reflective of the inner turmoil Kala herself dealt with with much of her life. The dark colors are t contrasted against the vibrant colors of the women's clothing, drawing the viewer's eyes first to the twinned image then to the vanishing point where the two women are joining hands. The deep earth tones provide a second comparison exemplifying the nature of the duality. 
So overall, the two Fridas, um, it seemed, it's seen as Kala using her biracial heritage to present not only the pain and heartbreak she felt from her divorce in 1939, but how she coped with the loss of her husband. Again, the left image is supposed to be her broken heart and stained image as divorce, right? This would also be possibly how society looked at her because divorce was not very common at that time. And on the right side, right, the Kala whose heart is whole, possibly they're still married because she is holding the image of, of him in her, in her hand. And so throughout these works, right, we can see just in these few works how she tried to deal with these different identities she had or she felt that were put on her or she felt that she had to develop or adopt. And what I want you to think about, right, this is just an example from one artist. There are many artists out there that have works that represent this dual identity. But what I want you to think about with Frida Kahlo's works is think about it in comparison or in companionship to different claims that Gloria and Zalda talked about in the reading you did, um, How to Tame a Wild Tongue. And think about this idea of identity and even this idea of dual identity.